Hello and welcome to Faith Evolving. My name is Mary Claire and today we're going to be talking about the seven deadly sins. Whether you personally believe in sin or not, the concept of the seven deadly sins have permeated pop culture. They're psychological thrillers, there's an anime, there's a bunch of books, fiction and non-fiction exploring, and I'm pretty sure there's even a, a Prince song about it. One day all seven will die. Pride, anger, envy, sloth, greed, gluttony, and lust packaged up nicely like a seven day week. But what exactly is sin, if we're gonna be talking about the seven deadly sins? Is it just some cookie cutter definition to try to shame people into one biblical definition of such and such? But sin is so much more than just a scare tactic. I would say it's more an absence of love. And whether you believe in a higher power or not, I think it can be generally agreed upon that an absence of love is the root of a lot of different issues in our societies. But love also isn't a very tangible term. What type of love are we talking about? There's familial love, you know, romantic love, friendship love, I love my dogs type of love. And sometimes love is even twisted to mean, hey, you wanna get coffee? I heard you're gay, just wanna let you know you're gonna go to hell. Oops, sorry, love is just mean sometimes, oops. However, my personal answer to Hathaway's what, what is love? love is radical compassion and grace. It's seeking the humanity or rather just like the life in another person and acting accordingly. Thus, sin would be doing anything that diminishes the humanity or the life in another person. But also, this love can be extended beyond humans to animals and the earth and all of this sort of thing as things deserving of care. Because sin requires one to see someone or something as not deserving of that love or care. And the seven deadly are no exception to this rule. However, I think sin is more action, but the seven deadlies are more like moods or dispositions. Angela Tilby talks about it in her book. Right here, I forget the title, even though I was supposed to be reading it all semester. This is because the person who kind of really started thinking about naming these seven deadlies was Evagrius, or Evagrius, who lived in and around what is modern day Turkey in the fourth century and was a desert father. There are also desert mothers and just like desert people, but it was an early form of monastic life before there were actual monasteries where people rejected the normal way of which you live your life and they went out into the desert to become closer to God. And while Vagrius was out there, he was thinking a lot about sin and he thought of these list of seven, well his was eight, which we'll get back to, as more like evil thoughts. And this is because these seven deadly dispositions are more like the roots of which bear these actions of sin. They're the ways in which one thinks and feels and interacts with the world, but they don't necessarily mean that you're going to do bad things. It's honestly just a reality of living and being human. No one can completely avoid the seven deadlies. It's just what you do when they, you know, start to bubble up. So let's engage with each of them a little bit deeper. Pride is often the first of the sins that people talk about. And if you were to place the seven deadlies on days of the week, pride is for Sunday. When if you're a Christian, you go to church and you're like, <laughs> Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And now pride is sometimes combined with vainglory, which Evagrius separated out in creating eight, but we talk about seven. So for all intents and purposes, I'm combining pride with vainglory. Now pride is a sense of self-sufficiency of, I can do it myself. I don't need anybody's help. Whereas vainglory is really concerned with one's image of being capable, of being excellent, and it's more like a facade to mask a sort of feeling of emptiness. 
However, there's a really interesting feminist critique on the way we study pride because pride can also manifest as self-abnegation. So like, I'm worthless, I don't deserve anything, I can't do anything on my own. And this is especially present in those who were socialized as girls. Rebecca DeYoung talks about this in terms of pusillanimity or a smallness of soul, which is that whole idea of like, I, I am not enough. I can't do, I need, I need all the help. I'm, I'm just, I'm a little helpless little, I'm helpless. Because here's the thing with pride, self-esteem and self-worth are good things. Patting yourself on the back when you did something hard and something challenging is good. So it's a little bit more of a moderation sort of thing, finding the right balance. I wanna real quickly bring up the concept of Pride Month or James Brown's song, Say It Loud. And people are like, but I thought pride was a sin. And those are examples of groups of people who have been marginalized, kind of combating that self-abnegation. Like, no, um, I have worth and I'm proud of who I am. And that's another example of pride being a good thing. Some of the virtues that are commonly associated with pride are humility, which is sort of that reverse, but also interdependency, cooperation, teamwork of, yeah, I've got my strengths, but I also am acknowledging I have weaknesses that might be someone else's strengths, so we're gonna all come together to work together, everyone having a seat at the table. And that's a way to combat pride. Say it's Monday, you wake up, and you're like, oh, who replaced my body with Garfield's? Saga. Because I'm grumpy. I hate Mondays. I'm feeling angry. Because we're talking about anger. Now, anger is generally a reaction to something else or a secondary emotion to an outside event. And anger helps point out certain pressure points or places of hurt or past hurts that need to be addressed. And the thing about anger is that it's all about the way you handle it. So there's right wrath and there's wrong wrath. So like you're having an argument with someone, you're really angry, a lot of hurt has happened, you could murder them, you could shove it all down, or you could talk to them about it. You could try to create some sort of change. And I know that's a s sort of like extreme version, but it's a really like concrete way to talk about right and wrong wrath. And the thing about anger and what is righteous rage is that it points out the things that you value. There's that common phrase, they will know we are Christians by our love. And my professor flipped that on its head of, they will know we are Christians by our rage, by what we are angry about. But one critique I wanna bring up is about tone policing. Whose righteous anger do we receive? And which anger is allowed to be labeled as righteous? For this, I want to play a clip of a NPR segment interviewing Brittany Cooper, author of Eloquent Rage. And she talks about the angry black woman stereotype. Whenever someone weaponizes anger against black women, it is designed to silence them. It is designed to discredit them and to say that they are overreacting, that they are being hypersensitive, that their reaction is outsized. And she says this happens because generally anger is an emotion that people are really uncomfortable with. It's something that they want to control rather than address. Unless, of course, we're talking about white men being angry and then, you know, the whole sort of American political system is designed to respond uh, to white male anger and white male discontent. Now, Cooper thinks about the energy that comes from her anger, not as something to be managed, but as a superpower to be used. We think about superpowers as like Batman using his smarts to outwit everybody or whatever. And I just think, you know, the biggest superheroes we've ever had have been Black women who have looked at a set of conditions that are designed for them to fail and designed to kill them and said, we're going to live anyway. And not only are we going to live, we're going to thrive. Now, she also admits that rage can be destructive. But that's why she says rage is just a starting point. 
Part of what I'm trying to get at is that Black women are never only angry. We can be angry and at the same time be joyous, at the same time be sad, at the same time be deeply in love or be heartbroken. So rage for me becomes the ground zero for the reclamation of, of Black women's full emotional lives. And so one of the traditional virtues associated with anger is patience. And that doesn't really work in situations of abuse. Oh, you're being patient enough to endure and keep enduring abuse, hoping that they'll change. Whereas Donald Capps offers instead that a virtue with anger is will, because anger is a very energizing emotion. It's passion, and passion is not bad. And that energizing passion and anger, when harnessed, can create change for the better. Come comparison, it's killing me slowly. I think I think too much. Tuesdays when you're like, I'm a little unhappy. Like I'm in my week, but things could be so much better. I'm I'm envious. Now, Buchner, Buchner. has a quote that envy is the consuming desire to have everyone as unsuccessful as you are. You're miserable, make everyone else miserable with you. And the thing about envy is you're punished by feeling envious. In the words of William Willimon, which is a fun name to say, with envy, everybody loses. And envy often stems from inferiority. If I'm being completely honest with you all, Envy is one that I feel very often. It's at this point in the video where, yeah, I'm going to promote ContraPoint's video on Envy because it's amazing. And yes, it is nearly two hours long, but it's amazing. And the critique I want to bring forth about Envy is with accountability. And it's something I've just been mulling over now, and so I would love feedback in the comments. But I'm thinking about in the fallout of if you have an ear to the deconstruction community online, the Joshua Tree situation. If you want to get caught up, I highly suggest the blog She Seeks Nonfiction written by Rebecca Colep. And I kind of know Rebecca because I was on the same God is Gray Zoom calls that she was on. And it's a really great resource to start from and then go from there. There was some rhetoric that people are only calling us out because they're jealous. They're jealous for successful or pretty or la di da di da. And so accusing others of envy can be used as a self-defense mechanism against accountability, against self-reflection, which is a bit ironic because I think envy is something that requires self reflection and introspection and I think only oneself can determine when they are envious and so it should be something we should be looking out for and I think questioning why are we envious and the thing about envy is it's often tied to ambition and ambition if you're like stepping on others or putting others down to raise yourself up not great but ambition when it comes to self-discipline and self-improvement and drive, that's a good thing. So when you're envious, it might be pointing out something that's important to you. So be in tune with that. And maybe don't accuse others of being envious if they have a good point about something that you're doing that's harmful. Waited for something and something died. So you've so made it to Wednesday halfway through the week, you're tired of it all, sloth. And sloth is often associated with laziness, but it is so much more than just simply laziness. The original word for sloth was acedia, or a lack of care. So sloth is often wrapped up in apathy. So it is a lack of care, a lack of passion, a lack of inertia maybe even a lack of emotion or passion that something like anger would bring. So there's numbing or malaise. It's like you're moving through, swimming through molasses. That's sloth. And sloth, I think, is often a result of 
burnout. It's sometimes even associated with sadness. And so here we need to be really, really careful when talking about sloth to keep a mental health critique in mind because some people have depression. And so these sloth symptoms are just a result of not having enough serotonin going on in their brain. And there's just a lot of extenuating circumstances that can cause sloth that we can make people feel really, really, really bad about when it's not in their control. The thing is, sloth begets more sloth. The more you're in it, the more you're tired, the more you're burnt out, the more you lean into it, that lack of inertia becomes its own inertia in a sense to just stay motionless. And that can really negatively impact relationships and hurt other people and even hurt yourself of think just like dishes piling up in your sink and it's so hard to muster that initial effort to just get the ball rolling that's loss so hello some of the virtues of sloth are Sabbath or rest and renewal. Something like the nap ministry. That account really talks about how especially people who have to fight for their survival every day in a society that wants to kill them, rest can be resistance. Renewal is beautiful. Uh, trying to push through burnout is just gonna cause more burnout but taking a little nap, getting a little rest, and then somehow getting back out of that and getting that inertia ball rolling again can also be really helpful. And once you do do that pushing through, it can build a sort of fortitude. But overall, I think if sloth is a lack of care, the best medicine is care, whether that's self-care or asking others to help care for you muscling through sloth isn't gonna do anything. So be kinder to yourself when you're experiencing sloth and it might just help get you out of that sloth. Thursday, the week's half over at this point. You're scrambling. You didn't get as much done as you had hoped to get done. And so you gotta keep everything together and with me and create a little cushion here to keep myself safe. More, 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 more. Greed. When we think of greed, at least for me, think consumerism, capitalism, Jeff Bezos, and all of those things are true. Living in a culture that rewards greed kind of socializes us to be like, maybe greed, maybe greed isn't so bad if I'm the one that's greedy. Maybe if I compete enough and I have enough money, <laughs> maybe I'll be safe. It's this scarcity mindset that's fostered. And the thing is, the people at the top profit the most in their greed from keeping the rest of us greedy too. And this is where a sort of economic class critique comes in. Now I am a college student, I don't work full time, and so I know a little bit about not being the most financially secure. And I'm not saying this to be like, give me your money. I'm just, I grew up upper middle class, so I have a safety net to fall back on. A lot of other people do not have that safety net. And so what is greed and what is accumulating for survival? And where does that line start and end? And how fuzzy is it? Because I think that line's pretty fuzzy. So it's really easy to talk about greed when it's concrete and it's the 1%. But what about us? Cause I don't think people that are in the 1% watch my videos. <laughs> what about our greed? When are we greedy? So I went to go research and try to find some sources to see if anyone else is on the same page of thinking about where the lines blur between greed and financial security. And instead, my Google search yielded a bunch of Sigma grime set bullshit, especially a lot of people quoting Robert Kiyosaki saying, 
It's the poor who are greedy, not the rich. In my experience, a lot of poor people are more greedy than rich people. Many poor people insist that the rich should pay all the taxes. The government should take care of them. They deserve a higher salary for doing the bare minimum at work. Well, should be redistributed, meaning they get money that someone else earned. And, oh my gosh, let's talk about Robert Kiyosaki for a second. Okay, so he's the founder of Rich Global LLC and the Rich Dad Company, so immediately sends off some red flags. So he built his wealth off of telling other people how to get rich. One of his big kickers of advice is to not go to school and instead invest in real estate AKA somehow already have enough money to buy up property, keep buying up property, and then having the ooey gooey pories rent from you and getting just money from their misfortune. Meanwhile, in 2007, the Ohio State Division of Real Estate and Professional Licensing issued a statement warning people against some of the illegal methods that he was advising people to do. He also has partnered with Amway, which is multi-level marketing. So, oh my gosh, don't listen to this guy. And I think I just got even more radicalized than I already was. Man, I don't know, maybe people that didn't inherit a lot of wealth are trying to put food on the table. And maybe the cost of living has risen dramatically, but the minimum wage hasn't. And you know whose pockets were lined? The rich dads like you. Okay, I need to calm down. So some of the virtues associated with greed are sharing and contentment. Because I think greed is very as a very anxious disposition. So what are healthier, kinder ways to be safe? You look like ravioli and I got the form you it's Friday. No, really, it's Friday as I'm filming this. And I'm hungry. Gluttony. I think gluttony is one of the most interesting sins, if I'm being completely honest. I mean, it started especially in, like, the medieval period and before of people hoarding food and not allowing other people to eat. You know, similar to greed, but specifically food and drink but also an overindulgence. And like greed, it stems from a sense of fear. So like fear of when am I gonna be able to have this meal again? I'm gonna eat a lot, I'm gonna eat a lot, I'm gonna eat a lot. But the thing when it comes to gluttony is that meals are necessary. Food is fuel. Food also can make you happy. I don't think that's a bad thing. Also, sharing a meal with someone is a very bonding experience. The act of eating is very vulnerable, can break the ice. And cooking with someone can also be bonding. Or even just cooking by yourself can be incredibly rewarding. But gluttony is an especially social sin. And we make a lot of snap judgments about their appearance and equating that to gluttony. And that's not okay. I'm beating around the bush, but the way we talk about gluttony and the way we interact with gluttony is incredibly fat phobic. I wanna highlight this video by Mickey Atkins talking about Pollen Morgan. If you're familiar with Pollen Morgan's terrible takes on health <laughs> and that the way someone's body looks is not necessarily indicative of their health. They also highlight a bunch of fat positive creators and also dietitians that encourage intuitive eating. Because the classic virtue for gluttony is temperance. And I think we need to be careful there to not say temperance means like counting calories or dieting because that can really easily lead into eating disorders. But rather that temperance is intuitive eating and listening to what your body needs, what your body is craving, what it wants, but also listening to it when your body is like, okay, we've had enough. We can stop for now. Now also with that, I want to make sure to be very clear that food deserts are a thing and perhaps hoarding healthy food and only making 
healthy, nutritious food like fruits and vegetables, with high nutritional value, only accessible to the rich is also an act of gluttony. All that to say, we need to approach gluttony from a feeling of how your body feels and health and not how your body looks and appearance with health because that's not helpful and it's not good. I said certified freak. Seven days a week. Wet ass P word. Make that pull out game week. It's Saturday night and you're all dressed up. You're going out on the town. You're looking good. You are feeling good. Other people are looking good. They are feeling good. You're noticing perhaps lusting. Now, lust is usually written as like, oh, it's obvious, <laughs> duh, lust, you know, it's the taboo one, we don't talk about it, but we're all feeling it, right? Yeah, we all feel it. Coming back to that later. And Christian culture in a lot of different pockets is very obsessed with this one particular disposition. Purity culture and covenant eyes. Covenant eyes. Covenant Eyes, the reverse VPN. It didn't work for Josh Duggar and it won't work for you. Covering up the shoulders and like, oh, gotta pull up my shirt just in case this choker doing too much, maybe, I don't know. But generally, I think lust isn't just, oh, you, you, you have desire. Uh, you are sinning, icky, gross. I think lust is the act of objectifying another or fantasizing about another and not seeing them as that full person, but rather an object to be used. And so when it comes to lust, sexual integrity is a very important thing. And I actually linked an article by a sex therapist about this um, and it talks about how it's not a one size fits all sort of thing and that's okay and it shouldn't be a one size fits all sort of thing but there are a lot of content creators that are deconstructing purity culture and you could very easily find them but i am not one of those content creators because i didn't really grow up in a lot of purity culture and also because i'm asexual and so I sometimes, when it comes to people talking about lust, I'm like, can we shut up about it already? Which brings me to the critique, which is one of my own, um, from reading all of this, of looking at lust through an asexual lens. Because so many of these authors are like, yeah, duh, I mean, it's the least creative one, Willemann says. Um, even animals do it. And it's like, can we? talk to just one asexual person when it comes to lust because no not everyone feels lust in that way of sexual desire when it comes to the list of the seven i'm like oh yeah that one's easy i got that one down but i do objectify people in other ways perhaps this idea of objectifying others to see what you can gain from them the pleasure you can get from them can be from romantic fantasies, can be tokenization, and expanding this view of lust and objectification of other people's bodies beyond just sex. Because no, pretty much every scholar that talks about lust, not everyone experiences it the way that you do. And talking about it so flippantly as if everyone does harms people and alienates people and makes them feel like they're broken. And that's not good either. All right, Whew. bringing this video to a close. Thank you all for watching. This was sort of a breakdown and critique of the seven deadly sins and the way they're often talked about. Um, make sure to, you know, if you want, like, um, comment even subscribe if you're feeling really really zesty 
I don't know what I'm saying, um, but I'd love to give a special shout out to my patron saints of Faith Evolving over on Patreon. So if you wanna help me in fostering my own pride, you can share this with a friend and like. Um, my anger, you could leave a really mean comment because that helps with the algorithm anyway. My envy, um, if you want to feed that green monster, you can actually not interact with this video and I'll compare myself to every other YouTuber and be like, I'm deficient. Why, I want their videos to not do well so I feel better about my videos not doing well. <laughs> if you wanna help me be more greedy, you know, you can join the Patreon or donate to my Kofi if you wanna do just like a one-time thing um, so I can just like acquire that wealth and feel safer. Also for my gluttony, so I can buy more snacks because I only had cashews. And uh, lust, I'm good on it, I'm good on it. Uh, maybe just don't look at me and thinking about that anyone's ever looked at me that way makes me want to never show my face again. So maybe don't talk about, <laughs> don't talk about lust actually. <laughs> don't talk about it. Um, and as far as sloth goes, I'm gonna go lay on my bed and stare at a wall for a little bit. My mind go completely blank, not for meditation, but rather to procrastinate on all the things I need to do. Thank you all for watching. Okay, bye. <laughs>